Hi folks, vices play a super important role as a machinist, and I think a lot of folks would agree that sometimes holding onto the part is the most difficult part of being a machinist. And when I was a kid, we had a bench vise in our basement, and that bench vise had these really nice serrated teeth that would bite into the part, and that was all I ever knew as a vise. So when I bought my first Toolmaker's vise, and it had these beautiful ground smooth jaws, I thought, how can this possibly hold on to something when they're perfectly smooth? There's a whole level of science and data behind it that I wanted to dive into. How much pressure is applied when we tighten that handle down? How much force do you need to hold on to the part? Does it matter how much of that part you're holding onto in the vise? So let's take advantage of having this load cell. Shout out to Orange Vice for letting us borrow this really, really cool tool that gives us a digital readout of how much force is being applied. So we can use this to not only check clamping pressure, but we can use it to try to dislodge a part and see how tightly it was being held. We use three tools in our shop to tighten vices. We've got those speed vice handles that are relatively short. We've got the traditional machinist vice handle, and then we've got torque wrenches. The hope here is we'll get some understanding of how much pressure is really being applied. So I had everyone in the shop, we've got folks of different ages, gender, weights, etc., come up and tighten the vise. First with the speed vise handle, then with the regular vise handle, and then I wanted to see with the torque wrench. Does everyone get the same consistent clamping pressure because you're using a torque wrench? So what did we learn from letting everybody come up and test? Well, some good and some disturbing results. The good answer is that things scaled as I thought. Using this shorter speed vise handle is the least amount of clamping pressure and that scales up as one would expect as you move to the larger vise handle. This also starts to give us some good data that we can keep in the back of our mind as a framework when we start to think about or compare work holding strategies, whether it's from a vise, moving over to vacuum, or even super glue, which we'll get to later in this video. So when we start with our normal speed vise handle, we got ranges from 950 up to 1400, but the average was somewhere around 1100 pounds of clamping pressure. Next up, everyone used that same speed vise handle, but I told them, push on it as hard as you feel comfortable pushing. Don't hurt yourself, don't try to be a hero. And somewhat as I expected, the results vary a little bit more here because that's a subjective definition and people are different. And that starts to tie into the first observation of this whole test, which is that a person's physical strength, their, how tall they are, their overall size, will definitely affect how they use and tighten a vise. Nevertheless, we got a pretty solid increase, the average being almost double at about 2,100 pounds. When we step up to the traditional vice handle, we've got that extra handle length that gives us a natural mechanical advantage to clamp down on that vice screw even harder. With the normal results averaging just slightly more than the hardest setting on the speed vice handle at 2,265 pounds. But it's when you start to step up to the quote unquote, the hard test that we start to see some real clamping pressure, averaging at about 4,100 pounds. The one that really surprised me was the torque wrench. We saw a few outliers while using the torque wrench, which surprised me because you would think that's the one thing the torque wrench is supposed to eliminate. And there's a couple of different factors at play. Number one is simply how do you use the torque wrench? Are you slowly pushing up with the torque wrench until you click it out? Or are you pushing as hard as you can? And then you might hear it click out or you might actually go a little bit past. Alex had the highest value, but he double clicked the torque wrench. After having such a wide range, I thought, well, Let's see if we can make more sense of this. So I came back and I did a second and a third test and still got varying ranges. And while that second and third test were a little further apart than I had hoped, they're actually pretty close to being in line with the median and the average throughout the torque wrench test across different users. And if we take out Alex's double click, the results are fairly consistent, especially when you consider the range of the physical characteristics of the folks that were using that tool to tighten the vise. But it's worth keeping in mind that torque wrenches aren't necessarily that accurate or repeatable. Torque wrenches themselves have varying degrees of quality and consistency. So I would still recommend torque wrenches. Just keep in mind, they're not necessarily a perfect solution and you should check or calibrate them periodically. A few months back, when we first got the load cell, the first thing I did was set up the load cell in the orange vise and set the torque wrench on 10 foot pounds, tighten the vise and measured the readout on the load cell. And I did that in five foot pound increments all the way up to 100 foot pounds and I built out this chart. Was during that test, tightening at 60 
foot-pounds led to 3,320 pounds of clamping pressure. That's pretty close to the values that I got the day we set up the test for everyone. We've got a card here to the NYC CNC website where you can download all the data from this test. But it's generally helpful to know that if you clamp a vise to say 80 foot pounds, you should get somewhere around 5,000 pounds of clamping force. The next thing that I wanted to understand is how securely is that part being held? The first question is, if we hold on to a relatively thin part of a block of aluminum, say a quarter inch, is that the same as if we hold on to the full one inch tall section? And I'm curious to see what you guys think. Hit pause and answer in the comments below. So we're using the load cell to push against the workpiece in a perpendicular manner. You can see on the left-hand side, I've got an indicator on the back side of the 246 blocks. That's just a double check to make sure we're not deflecting the wrong way. And then we've got an indicator on the end of our raw material. Now the values that we're seeing here on the load cell are not important so much as they are relative to each other. So as we start to increase the pressure using the screw as a jack screw to push the load cell against the part, I wanna see when our indicator shows that we've started to move that part or we've overcome the clamping pressure. I learned something. Rather than just using the dial indicator on the right hand side to see when the bork piece material moves, we can use the load cell values to see when they start to slip. So here I'm slowly increasing the pressure and seeing does the load cell value stay the same or does it reduce? Because if it reduces, that means the clamping pressure is reduced and the only way that can happen is we've started to push that workpiece in the vise. So I'll admit, I was conflicted. I sat there and I thought, wait a minute here. If you're clamping with a whole bunch of surface area, that should be more secure than just clamping onto a thin part of the workpiece. But that's not what the data showed. The data showed it was about the same. Now there's a lot of other factors that we'll come back to on this. So I emailed Eric at Orange Vice and I proposed what I thought was the answer. And he wrote back and he said, clamping force isn't to be confused with clamping pressure. Clamping pressure is affected by surface area where clamping force is not. So in actuality, larger clamping area actually decreases pressure. So what's the difference between pressure and force? It's the formula. Pressure equals force over area. So if I'm pushing with force, I have to divide that force over how much surface area I'm contacting, and that equals pressure. So as we tighten that vise down with the same amount of force, but we're distributing that force over the larger surface area of our piece of aluminum, that's actually decreasing, theoretically, the clamping pressure. So that's actually really exciting to me. It kind of blew my mind because generally I had thought, well, hey, if I want to be more safe or conservative, I'll use lower parallels or hold on to more of the workpiece. So does this mean you're good to go and hold on to as thin as part as possible? Well, no, but let's play around with that. So I want to test the part in some talon jaws that are applying all of that clamping force into a small area, increasing the pressure and see how well those hold on. Let's start by clamping our piece of aluminum in regular smooth vice jaws, aka hard jaws. Let's tighten the vise using a torque wrench set at 20 foot-pounds, and then let's measure how much force it takes with the load cell to move or deflect that part. At 20 foot-pounds, the value was 150 on the load cell, and we incremented it up in 10 foot-pound increments with 70 foot-pounds of torque on the vice screw requiring 675 units on the load cell to move the part. So this data in and of itself isn't that helpful, but what we can do with this data is use it to compare how many load cell units it takes to deflect the part when we switch over to other work holding methods. The first one I wanted to try, we're switching to a gripper style jaws. Here we're using the MMM grip jaws. And as I expected, we're applying the same amount of force across a smaller surface area, which it results in higher pressure and thus it should take more load cell units to move the part and that generally held true in fact starting off with 20 foot pounds we were almost double the load cell value to deflect or move the workpiece almost double again at 30 and then they started to converge at 40 and 50 and in fact did converge at 60 foot pounds and then much to my surprise they inverted with the grip jaws having less alleged holding power at 70 foot pounds which doesn't make sense except 
I'm suspecting that it's because our part was worn out. But let us know in the comments below if you folks have a different thesis or was it just the repeated biting of that material that changed the way those serrations interact with the material. If you haven't seen our video on super glue, card here to the NYC CNC page that we keep posted with some of the latest tips and tricks that we've learned. But combining a traditional super glue with either painter's tape or in this case, we're using a higher temp powder coat style tape gives a really good recipe for easy and surprisingly secure work holding with the caveat that its work holding power is a function of the surface area of the part. The rule of thumb that we use around the shop is if you have about 36 square inches, AKA a six by six inch piece of material, especially aluminum, you can go to town machining on that part. But let's take a look at what forces look like with a smaller piece. In this case, starting off with a two by two or only four square inch piece of material. And that four square inches of surface area really doesn't have the ability to hold on. Even before we reach a hundred pounds on the load cell, we've got pretty substantial amount of deflection and that deflection continues in a relatively linear manner until it completely fails. The part pops off at a value just over 400. Stepping up to a four by four inch piece of material or 16 square inches, we have a minor amount of deflection as we start increasing the pressure up to 160, but we are able to increase the pressure to over a thousand pounds until we finally see the part failed at just over 1500 pounds of clamping pressure. I'm so glad that we filmed this as a video because it let us re-watch some of these tests and realize things that weren't totally apparent when you're in the middle of doing the actual test. The first of which is, why the heck is that indicator showing so much movement or deflection before the super glue fails? Shouldn't super glue fail in a pretty catastrophic binary manner, meaning it's either adhered or it totally separates? And the answer is actually a pretty good shout out to the power of super glue and this work holding technique, which is take a closer look and you'll realize we're actually shifting that part inside the vice jaws. Now that's on us for not paying closer attention and we caught that mistake. So stick around here, you'll see more. There is still some normal deflection, but it's a minor amount and it's caused by the tape. One of the keys to successful super glue work holding is surface prep. You've seen us burnish the tape onto the material. We've cleaned the parts and degreased them. In this test, we're taking it one step further, scuffing up that otherwise smooth tape to promote adhesion. And we're able to get it close to 2000 pounds before it fails. Next up, testing out steel with the super glue method. Steel is trickier for two reasons. Number one, the tape just doesn't like to adhere to steel nearly as well as it adheres to extruded aluminum. And secondly, the harder nature of steel means you're using higher cutting forces, which means a comparable cut in steel is gonna push that part harder and cause that super glue to fail. I really wanted to get some hard data around this with the test and the reality was our test isn't quite scientific enough right now and it just fails so quickly and the consequences are not good. I would wholeheartedly recommend a lot of non-ferrous materials like aluminum and brass and copper with sufficient surface area it can be an excellent candidate for aluminum but generally stay away from steel with super glue. Last test, super gluing a four by four piece of aluminum directly onto the aluminum fixture. So the difference here is we're not using the tape. The tape is great because it makes it really easy to separate the part when you're done and not have to deal with a super glue residue on your part or on your fixture. But as this test shows us that tape is also why we get that creep or that flex causing the dial indicator to move quite a few thou before the part breaks off. Without that tape layer, the part is much more rigid. In fact, so rigid in this example that we realize we are pushing the whole fixture to the right in the talon jaws, calling it a day at just over 2,200 pounds. So let us know in the comments below, what do you guys wanna see next? What do we do with this? to either improve the way we're processing this data. We're not data scientists, but we just rigged this up to, to try to learn as laymen. Uh, and what more tests should we try? Hope you folks learned something. Hope you enjoyed. Take care. See you soon.